numerous potential and possibilities, discussions with fascinating people, designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, again to another episode of the show with another fascinating guest who is really involved in creating uh, an amazing tomorrow for all of us. Uh, we're honored today to be joined by Dr. Bruce Grayson, uh, who is the Chester Carlson Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at the University of Virginia. He's the former director of UVA's Division of Perceptual Studies and who has been widely acknowledged uh, as the father of research in the area of near-death experiences. Uh, Dr. Grayson was previously on the medical faculty at the University of Michigan and the University of Connecticut, where he was the clinical chief of psychiatry. Uh, and Dr. Grayson has consulted uh, with the National Institutes of Health and Address Symposia on near-death experiences and the broader theme of consciousness uh, at a range of venues around the globe, from the United Nations to uh, personal audience with the Dalai Lama. Uh, he has earned awards for his research and was elected as a Distinguished Life Fellow of the American Psychiatric Association, uh, the highest honor bestowed by that organization. Uh, Dr. Grayson's interest in near-death experiences began a few months after he graduated from medical school, school which will hear a fascinating case of a patient in the emergency room. Uh, we'll talk more about that. Uh, Dr. Grayson founded the International Association of Near-Death Studies, an organization to support and promote research into these experiences, and for the last 27 years, has edited the Journal of Near-Death Studies, the only scholarly journal dedicated to near-death research. Uh, through his research, he's discovered common and universal themes in near-death experiences that go beyond uh, the neurophysiological or the cultural interpretations, as well as patterns of consistent after effects on individuals. Uh, and Dr. Grayson is a, uh, a published author. Uh, his book, After, uh, Dr. Explores What Near-Death Experiences Reveal About Life and Beyond, will be coming out shortly. And he's also co-author of both The Irreducible Mind and co-editor of the Handbook of Near-Death Experiences. Uh, Dr. Bruce Grayson, thank you for taking the time to come on the show today. Thank you, Ira. I, I'm glad to be here with you this morning. And thank you for that kind introduction. Absolutely, absolutely. I've been really looking forward to this. Um, uh, specifically on the show, we, we give our guests the floor just for a little bit to introduce themselves. If you could sort of uh, take us back a little bit to sort of uh, the beginning of your journey, uh, how you, you know, got interested in medicine and psychiatry, uh, and a little bit of uh, the time you spent on that original case uh, with, uh, with the patient name was Holly uh, in the book. I think that'd be a, a great way to start things off and how you got set on this road. <laughs> Let me back up a while. Um, I grew up in a scientific household. My father was a chemist, and I was raised in a family that never talked about spirituality or religion in any way. It wasn't, uh, we were anti-spiritual. We just never, it never came up. Uh, our world was the material world. What you see is what you get. And following in my father's footsteps, I tried to create a career as a scientist and finding um, people more interesting than molecules, I ended up going into medicine, uh, applying the scientific method to medical problems. What drew me to psychiatry was that there seemed to be so many more unanswered questions in that field than in other areas of medicine. So I ended up um, applying for a psychiatric residency, an internship and in residency. And in my first year, of, re of internship, in fact, a few months out of medical school, when I hardly knew what I was doing, I went to see a patient in the emergency room and she was unconscious over presumed overdose. I tried to examine her and I couldn't really speak with her, but her roommate had brought her in and was waiting down the hall in the, another room for, to talk to me. So I went down to that room and talked with her. Uh, I then came back and saw the patient who was still unconscious, ascertained that she was going to be admitted to the intensive care unit because of irregular heartbeats, and then agreed to come back in the morning and reevaluate her. When I came back in the morning, she was no longer unconscious, but she was quite drowsy from the overdose. I started to talk to her, introduced myself, and she said, I know who you are. I remember you from last night. And that kind of shook me because I thought she was unconscious when I saw her before. So I said, well, you mean the nurses told you I spoke with you last night? And they said, no, I saw you. And I said, well, I thought you couldn't see me because I thought you were asleep. And she said, not in my room. I saw you talking to my roommate down the hall. Well, that kind of threw me because here I was, a new doctor trying to appear, appear professional. I was supposed to be guiding this interview learning about her suicidal thoughts and what she had done the night before. And she threw me for a loop here. 
So I tried to clarify what she was saying. And then she opened her eyes wide for the first time and told me with a bit of an edge exactly what I was saying to her roommate, what I was wearing, including some embarrassing details that she couldn't possibly have known unless she had been in that room watching us. And I could not understand how that could possibly be. As far as I could tell, I was my body. And the idea of leaving your body and going somewhere else was just inconceivable. I couldn't understand how that could happen. But I didn't have time to deal with that. I was there to try to help her with her suicidal thoughts. So I tried to push it out of my mind and get on with my work. I did that for a few more years, um, trying to push this out of my mind. I could not explain it. Um, occasionally I would go back to it to try to explain it. I couldn't find an explanation. I just thought maybe it was a trick that she played somehow. I couldn't imagine how. And then about four or five years later, I met Raymond Moody, who wrote a book called Life After Life, which was the first book in English to use the term near-death experiences and to describe what these phenomena were like. And in talking to Raymond, I realized this was kind of what Holly was talking to me about. And it wasn't just a unique thing to her. It wasn't just one trick she was doing. This was apparently a common experience. As a scientist, I had to go into the, look into this. You know, scientists can't have the luxury of choosing what they want to study and what they don't. If something is unexplained, that's where you go for the information. So that launched me on a campaign to try to understand what these experiences were all about. And now it's about 45 years later and I'm still trying to figure it out. Wonderful, wonderful. I appreciate that intro. And, uh, you know, it, it's interesting as, as you were uh, talking about spirituality uh, at the beginning, um, it, was, it was very interesting to find that um, in the American Psychiatric Association's, uh, you know, DSM classification, that um, near-death experiences sort of get tucked away in this, ca this category <laughs> called other conditions that may be the focus of clinical attention. And then there's this religious or spiritual problem category, which sounds like a rather crude way to refer to these. But uh, I think you pointed out in, in some of your um, literature that uh, this at least allows for you to differentiate them from other things, uh, other forms of out-of-body experiences or other mental disorders that may have... Could you just start us off a little bit as we then go further on into sort of how you currently define sort of the scope of an, of an NDE as compared to uh, other things that might seem like one but are not? Right. Well, first, let me say about the um, American Psychiatric Association's um, guideline for, for diagnosis. I was glad that they put this in this special category of other conditions that may cause people to seek help which was clearly saying these are not mental illnesses. They're not mental disorders. They're just life problems that may cause someone to seek help. And in fact, when they wrote the original paper arguing for this religious or spiritual problem category, they used several of patients, of patients I had seen who were struggling with near-death experiences to rationalize why they needed this category. So basically what a near-death experience is, is a profound subjective experience that many people have when they come close to death. And that includes people who are actually pronounced dead when their hearts stop or when their breathing stops. It also includes people who just fear they are going to die. For example, people who fall off a height, like a mountain. And as far as we know, their hearts didn't stop. And yet they were certain they were going to die. And they may have a full-fledged near-death experience on the way down. What these experiences typically look like are an overwhelming sense of peace and well-being. And remember, this is in the context of coming close to death, which is a terrifying and often very painful experience. And all of a sudden, the pain and the fear dissolve, and you are overwhelmed by the sense of well-being. Everything is the way it should be. Often there's this feeling of being unconditionally loved. People often feel like they leave their physical bodies during this experience. They may go through a life review, what's been called a panoramic memory, seeing events from their past life. They may encounter deceased loved ones, and they may encounter other beings, which often they can't identify, but is experienced as being a divine being. 
Sometimes they will put a label to this, call it God or Christ or something else. But often they just say, it was a warm, loving being of light that radiated unconditional love. At some point, they either make a decision to come back or are told to come back or just find themselves back in the body. I want to... Before I get, we, we continue on that, I, I wanted to take a quick segue because I think it's, it's really important to the things we're going to get into later on. And I, I want to go to, and it's the middle of the book, but to sort of chapter 11, which is entitled Mind is Not the Brain. Right. Uh, and this is a, a theme that we've approached. Uh, I mean, you know, I had the opportunity to talk to uh, folks in some different areas. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the past with, um, with Dr. Mike Levin up at Tufts, who studies a lot about so called sort of non central nervous system information right. processing that happens in, you know, organisms that don't have brains or slime molds that don't have nervous systems right. or, or the range of stuff that happens in the human body and non-excitable tissue. Uh, also spent a little time with, uh, with John Joe McFadden over in the UK, who, while he's dabbling in, in quantum biology, uh, spends a lot of time thinking about fields that extend sure. from the human body that, uh, you know, uh, whether it's here or there. With the examples that you have collected over the years, whether they be uh, the NDE, you know, I'm, hey, I'm watching my surgery as I'm lying there after a heart attack, or in the case of uh, Holly, where I've gone down the hallway, um, walk us just a little bit through uh, Dr. Grayson's thinking today in 2020 on this mind versus brain issue. Sure. Well, I was raised, as most people were, with the belief that the mind is what the brain does. That was the only context I had when I was growing up. I didn't know about anything non-physical at that point. And certainly there's a lot of uh, evidence from everyday life about that. When you get drunk or intoxicated, you don't think so clearly. And that's clearly your brain is being affected and your mind is affected. Uh, when you have a stroke or when you get hit over the head, um, that affects your thinking. So there's lots of reasons to suspect that the brain does create the mind. And that's a useful model in everyday life. However, when you get to extreme circumstances like near-death experiences, that correlation, that association between brain and mind seems to break down. We have many cases now of people who have apparently no brain function while their minds are still able to think and feel and remember. In fact, many people say in the near-death experience, their thoughts were clearer and faster than ever before. Their senses were more vivid. And yet, they apparently had very little or no brain function at that time. How do we explain that? I don't know. Um, and that's why I'm still looking into this field after 50 years of trying to study it. Uh, you mentioned the possibility of um, neural processes outside the brain that have, have, may have a role, and certainly we're discovering more and more about the nervous system elsewhere in the body, for example, in the abdomen, that can affect our moods and so forth. But there's really no evidence yet that thinking, complex thinking and perceiving and memorying, remembering is associated with any part of the brain other than the cerebral cortex, um, the newer part of our brain, so to speak. It's only been out around a few million years. Um, and as you mentioned, there are also organisms that don't even have neurons, that don't even have nerve cells that communicate. We now know that even trees communicate with each other by the analogy of, um, of human hormones. So it's possible to communicate, but we don't have evidence of any complex thought and perceptions and memory formation without an intact brain, except in extreme circumstances. And the near-death experience is one of those. There are others as well. For example, some people who have irreversible end-stage Alzheimer's disease, who have not been able to recognize family or speak for years, will suddenly become completely lucid in the moments before death. They are able to recognize people and carry on coherent conversations, sometimes for minutes, sometimes hours, before they die. And as far as we can tell, there's no way that the brain can reconstruct itself in this end stage dementia. So we're left with no way to explain this revival of, of, of uh, memories and of thinking of cognition uh, 
without the brain being corrected. So it seems in that case also, the mind and the brain are not the same. We've also found in the last decade doing neuroimaging of people with extreme psychedelic drug trips, which have mystical elements, that the evidence from the neuroimaging shows a dissociation between mind and brain. We used to think that these psychedelic drugs stimulate the mind to produce hallucinations. But this sophisticated neuroimaging shows that the more extreme mystical experiences people have with psychedelic drugs is associated with a decrease in brain function. There's less electrical activity during these mystical states and there's less, less connection between different parts of the brain. So again, we seem to have a disconnection between the mind and the brain. That opens the question of what is the mind and where is the mind? And I don't have answers to those. At least you're looking at them. <laughs> uh, brilliant, brilliant stuff. Um, continuing along that path, and you, you, uh, you, uh, you read my mind uh, in this next uh, question I have lined up. Um, you know, as you were talking about sort of this uh, consistent set of, of features and sequences of events that you've documented over the last few decades, um, as you were saying, this theme of clarity, um, and, and whether we're talking about the, the near-death experience or the, the terminal lucidity in the Alzheimer's patients, um, very similar, I, I, uh, I had the opportunity to uh, to talk to uh, Chris Kerr a few months ago, who you know spends his time on end of life yes. dreaming. Yeah. Similar theme there as well. You know this this increased clarity before death. Um, I'm very interested though because another related topic uh, that has always intrigued me is sort of what happens to some people that's completely opposite of this uh, or sort of delirium, um, which is very opposite of clarity, but happens, you know, at the end of life as well. Um, I'm just interested in, in what percent of, of the cases that you've looked at over the years do you have this increase in clarity? And is there sort of a, a other class of NDE where it's, you know, more of a, you know, where the hell at, you know, did I go? A, a more dreamlike state and unaware of yourself versus, hey, I'm floating around with this entity and I'm happy. Any comp comparison between these two sort of unique events, let's say, that happens. Sure, sure. Uh, let, me, let me take those two questions separately. Uh, the Thank first you. was regarding how many people, as they're approaching death, have this return of lucidity. Yeah. And the answer is it's a very, very small minority. Okay. The vast majority of people who have advanced dementia or other uh, neurological diseases and, and have trouble with their thinking and their memory and their perceptions do not recover before they die. Mm. It's only a very small number who have these experiences. Ah. And often the people aren't around to record them. Now, if you ask people uh, who work in hospice, particularly the nurses who are by the bedside with the patients more often, they will say, oh yes, it's very common. But we don't have a lot of documentation of that. And in fact, a colleague in Germany, uh, Michael Nam and I did a survey of the literature of the last couple of hundred years, and we found only 80 cases in which this was, this was described in the medical literature. So it's not a common uh, uh, thing for, by, any, by any means, and yet even one requires us to look for an explanation. How can this possibly be? And we don't have an explanation yet at this point. I should say that it's not just Alzheimer's disease. This happens with schizophrenia, with uh, brain abscesses, with a variety of, of brain diseases. So we can't look for just one mechanism that's irrelevant in one disease. It's something that crosses all diagnoses. Mm -hmm. You also asked about ex near-death experiences that aren't the typical pleasant kind. Mm. I should say first that there are a lot of things that happen when you come close to death that aren't near-death experiences. Okay. For example, some people just get terrified and experience nothing else other than the terror. And we can't call that a near-death experience. Mm -hmm. There are people who have post-traumatic stress after a close brush with death, and that's not a near-death experience. What we mean by a near-death experience is this sense of being maybe outside the body, but certainly in some other realm of having your thinking change, go faster, uh, clearer, um, it's a very hyper-real experience. Mm 
People in delirium, which you mentioned, often have an experience later when they, that they'll describe later on as being unreal. Mm. And they'll recognize that that wasn't reality. This is reality. Right. Whereas people who have a near-death experience say the NDE, the near-death experience, was more real than this everyday reality. And we don't have an explanation for that either. Mm. Now, not all near-death experiences follow the same pattern. There are some that are not experienced as blissful. We don't know how many because it's hard for people to talk about those things. Um, people who have tried to quantify this have guessed between one and 5% of near-death experiences are not pleasant. Mm. But again, if you have an unpleasant experience, you're less likely to talk about it. So we really don't know what the numbers are. Continuing along that path, um, you know, you've written that um, a decent percentage of, of, of the uneasy documented have this um, peaceful, sort of joyous component to them. Um, not always, of course, but uh, there are uh, positive transformations that may follow, uh, but there may be difficulties. And you point out uh, interesting sort of paradoxes where you may have a, uh, say, a very religious person that has a beautiful NDE, but they don't run into the God they expected, let's say, right. or uh, somebody that has a, a hellish NDE that, um, you know, they straighten their life out afterwards. Uh, talk a little bit about some of these paradoxes and some of the interesting things that you've seen. Right. It's not at all unusual for people to experience things in their near-death experience that they were not expecting. And that's one of the things that makes us take them seriously as real experiences, not just fantasies. And particularly people who have a strong religious um, upbringing may encounter things that they weren't expecting. And they always give precedence to the experience itself rather than their teaching. And they will say, yes, I saw a God, but it wasn't the God I was taught about. You know, they will say, I encountered this warm, loving being, and I don't know what it was. I'll call it God just so I can talk with you, but it wasn't really God the way we know it. And some who are familiar with other cultures may say, well, it could be anything. It could be God. It could be Allah. It could be Krishna. It could be Buddha. I don't know, whatever you want to call it. It was something beyond me, something greater than I am that was loving and caring. Uh, so it's not at all surprising to see people have experiences in the near-death experience that contradict what they were think what they were believing before that. There was a second part of your question that I can't remember now. I was talking about the reverse. Now, a, um, somebody that has a, a, a not that nice a, a, a right. near-death experience, but that, but that straightens them out. Let's say when they come back, that they got to get right. their life in order or stop doing X or Y. <laughs> right, right. Well, as I said, the, the majority of near-death experience are blissful and people feel they are taught in the near-death experience how to live, basically. What makes a life meaningful and fulfilling? And often they say, these weren't things that I had never heard before. They were things I was reminded of. And in fact, some of the critics of near-death experiences say, well, the lessons from NDEs, from near-death experiences, are all cliches. Well, yes, they are, because most of our religions teach these things, basically the golden rule, that we're all in this together, and you should treat other people the way you want to be treated. And that's one of the main lessons of near-death experiences, that that's not just a goal we should strive for, but that's the way the universe works. And people often do change their lives as a result of that. That's often a very positive experience. Sometimes it is not. Mm. For example, uh, Steve Price was a career Marine and he was shot in Vietnam and the, a bullet went into his chest through his lungs. He was whisked off to the Philippines to a military hospital. And during that operation, his heart stopped and he had a near-death experience, a typical, beautiful, blissful experience. When he came back, he found that his attitudes and beliefs and values were transformed. He was a young guy in his 20s, a career Marine. He was a sergeant at that point. All he wanted was to go back into the field and, and do his work. And he tried, 
but he found that he couldn't shoot anymore. He couldn't kill somebody after that. So he ended up having to leave the Marines, which had been his lifelong goal to be a Marine, ended up coming back to the States and basically working as a paramedic. Um, and you see that typically in people who are in a, a violent career like a police officer or a competitive uh, business career. And they find that those values are no longer relevant. And they often go into helping professions, teaching, uh, healthcare, uh, social work, and so forth. Now, people who have unpleasant experiences often have the same kinds of after effects. They seem to learn in the experience or come back from the experience with the same set of values that make them want to transform their lives. And that can be seen as a course correction. Now, what we found in studying these people is that the after effects are not quite as strong as in people who have a positive, pleasant experience. And I think the reason for that is these unpleasant near-death experiences uh, are hard to work with, hard to live with. And many people try to just put them out of their minds and try to not think about them. And they tend not to process them as much as people process the pleasant ones. Very interesting. Uh, chapter nine uh, you, is titled The Biology of Dying. Uh, and you take us on a walk through uh, the neurobiology uh, of NDEs and, and what we've been studying in terms of uh, neurotransmitters and various hormones and so forth. Um, I was interested uh, if uh, in your studies in this particular area, as you sort of you know, dive down into sort of different things that are happening in the brain, um, if there are any surprises, obviously, you know, there might be certain hormones that give you feelings of euphoria or empathy before, uh, and anything uh, strange show up in the sense that, uh, that you would not normally associate with um, those particular states? Uh, did anything stand out as, well, that's strange uh, that <laughs> XYZ would be turning on as opposed to just uh, some opiates or serotonin or, or, or what have you? And I apologize, I'm talking out of, <laughs> sure. out of my, I'm not a neuropharmacologist, but go ahead. Well, I should say, I read that few people know more about it than, than you do because we just don't know that much about this. Uh, I'll also say that almost everything I found was a surprise to me. I started out life my first 25 years as a diehard materialist. And I, when I first started studying near-death experiences, I was certain that there was going to be some simple physiological explanation for them. And the more I looked, the less I found. You know, near-death experiences happen from, from a variety of ways of coming close to death. So we wanted to look for something that occurs no matter how you came close to death. What else, what happens common to all these experiences? And the final common pathway is usually lack of oxygen getting to the brain. So we looked at that and it didn't seem promising at first because we know from clinical medicine that when you have less oxygen going to the brain, you get belligerent, fearful, agitated, confused, very much unlike the calm, peaceful, clear experience of the near-death experience. And yet we looked, and study after study has shown that people who have come close to death and had near-death experiences actually have more oxygen going to the brain than people who come close to death but don't have NDEs. Mm -hmm. So the near-death experience is associated with better oxygen flow to the brain than less. Now, I should caution you here that all this research is just correlational. What it may mean is that people who have better oxygen flow to the brain are better at remembering what happens when they came close to death. So they're more able to talk about the near-death experience. It may be people that have decreased oxygen also have NDEs, but can't remember it later on. We also looked at other things that happen when you're, you're dying or when the brain is falling. In addition to increased, uh, we thought decreased oxygen, there's an increase in carbon dioxide. And we tried looking at that. And again, there was no correlation between carbon dioxide levels in the brain and having a near-death experience. We also looked at 
chemicals that people were given at the time of the near-death experience. And we found that there was no association between the drugs people were given and whether they had an experience or not, with the single exception that, generally speaking, the more drugs people are given in this near-death state, the less likely they are to report a near-death experience afterwards. Mm. That may mean that they're less likely to have them. It may again mean only that they're less likely to remember them afterwards. There are also reasons to think that there may be some chemicals produced in the brain that may be contributing to a near-death experience. For example, we know that certain chemicals are produced under stress that help you function more calmly and more uh, efficiently. Uh, and one of the main ones, ones is the class of drugs called endorphins, mm -hmm. which produce the runner's high. That's most people are familiar with that. Sure. When you've been running and all of a sudden the pain goes away, you start feeling wonderful, that's an endorphin effect. It's often very short-lived. And unfortunately, it's very hard to detect chemically because it's usually very localized in the brain. So you need to know exactly where in the brain to look and exactly the right second. And that's virtually impossible to test in someone who's having a critical near-death state. Um, so it's an interesting hypothesis that endorphins may be implicated at least in the feeling of well-being in a near-death experience, but it's basically not testable. Now there is one way that we can indirectly test it. When people are brought into the emergency room unconscious, one of the first things that's often done is they're given a narcotic antagonist, something to mm -hmm. block narcotics. Sure. Um, if they're unconscious because they've taken an overdose, this will correct it right away. And if they have not, it'll do nothing to them. So it's a safe way to test whether someone is just unconscious because of narcotics. So many people are given these narcotic antagonists when they come into the emergency room. Now those drugs will also block endorphins. So presumably if the endorphin was causing a near-death experience, you would see less near-death experiences in people who are given these narcotic antagonists. And that does not seem to be the case. There was also reasons to look at uh, the EEGs, the, the brain activity, the electrical mm -hmm. activity in the brain when people are having near-death experiences to see whether some parts of the brain may be associated with this. And there were some theories that it was the, the temporal lobe. Most people thought it was the right temporal lobe. Some people looked at the left. And that area of the brain is certainly associated with, with memory formation and memory retrieval. So there was some reason to think about that. But there have been a number of studies now that looked at people who have seizures that involve the temporal lobe. And occasionally those people will report a sense of at least being unaware of their bodies, if not frankly, out of their bodies. And study after study has shown that there is no association between any one part of the brain and those sensations of being without the body. Um, there's other evidence that points in that same direction. Uh, Mario Beauregard, a neuroscientist, when he was at the University of Montreal, did a study with near-death experiencers and had them meditate and try to recreate in their minds their near-death experience while he measured their EEGs and other types of neuroimaging as well. And he found that there was no one area that was involved with the near-death experience. There were areas all over the brain that got activated. And this actually shouldn't be surprising because there's thinking going on, there's perceptions going on, there's memory formations going on, there's very strong emotions going on, and these all involve different parts of the brain. So it's no surprise that the entire brain gets involved, at least in the recollection and the retelling of a near-death experience. There are also some reports in the last few years of a brief surge in electrical activity um, at the point of death. And there were speculations that that might be associated with a near-death experience. Um, these, these, ex these studies did not include any report of what the people were experiencing. Um, for example, in one study, it was done with people who did go on to die, and just recorded a brief uh, pulse of electricity shortly before death. 
Again, they didn't talk to these people to know what they were experiencing. There was another study done with rats where they sacrificed the rats and found that for about 30 seconds after they were sacrificed, there was a brief surge in electrical activity. Now, these are tiny surges, uh, not at all the amount of electricity that was going on in the brain before they were sacrificed. And again, with the humans uh, whose EEGs were measured as they were dying, is a very small surge. Not at all the type of activity you would associate with normal consciousness, let alone enhanced consciousness. And we also know from decades of research with people who are having heart attacks that for the vast majority of people, the EEG, the brain activity, uh, starts to fall within five or six seconds. And within the first 20 seconds, it's totally flat, indicating no activity at all going on in the brain. So in short, we have looked at many different ways of trying to find what's going on physiologically in the brain during the near-death experience. And we have not found any consistent evidence that anything we can blame for the NDE occurs in the brain. While we're finishing up with that theme, uh, I, you mentioned early on in the uh, in discussion um, uh, psychedelics and DMT yes. type effects. Um, obviously, a lot going on nowadays with with substances like psilocybin right. and, and and fear of death uh, in, in clinical studies. I think at Hopkins and I forget where else. But um, any interesting comparisons as you know, when you I guess as of, of your current work look at some of this data uh, comparing a um, an NDE in reducing fear of death versus a psychedelic drug. Yes, there is some very interesting work. You mentioned Hopkins, and they do most of their work with psilocybin, which is a, um, a serotonin uh, uh, activating drug mostly. And they have found that doses of psilocybin can produce mystical experiences given the right circumstances. And it can also produce a profound decrease in fear of death. Mm -hmm. Now, other areas, the other large, other large lab that's doing this is um, Imperial College in London. And they have been studying mostly other drugs like ketamine, mm. um, which are not serotonin uh, drugs. Um, and DMT, dimethyltryptamine, is another drug that's often mentioned. Uh, these are all drugs that have different mechanisms of action. So there's no consistent uh, neurotransmitters that are affected by these different drugs. When you look at the, the way people describe near-death experiences and the way people describe these drug experiences, they often use a lot of the same words. Mm -hmm. They will talk about light. They will talk about peace. They will talk about leaving their bodies sometimes. But that doesn't mean the experience is the same. Yeah. What it may mean is just that we have a limited number of words to describe something. You know, if you ha talk to somebody who has just watched a movie about a war and ask them to describe what they saw and what they felt, and then you ask someone who's actually been in combat what they saw and felt, they may use a lot of the same words to describe the combat scene. But if you ask them, was this real or not? There's no question in their minds. The person who was in combat experiences as a real event. And the person who watched the movie knows that it was not real. It was just a poor imitation of, what, of reality. And that's what happens when you ask people who have these drug trips as well. By and large, they will say, well, I know I didn't really leave my body. I just had that sensation as if I was leaving. Whereas if you talk to near-death experiences, they'll say, there's no question. I was not in that dead body anymore. Fascinating. Uh, we're moving, moving towards the, the latter part of the book. Um, two very, I know it's all fascinating, but two really fascinating things to me. Chapter 20, uh, Life Before Death. Obviously, for many years, you I guess work down the hall or around the corner from, from Dr. Jim Tucker at, at UVA. Um, you focus on the end of life. He focuses on the beginning of life uh, with children who claim to remember things from past lives and so forth. Obviously, uh, that's a di for a different show, but um, I guess as you guys were hanging out doing your work, uh, connections, any interesting 
uh, uh, relationships between your work, uh, aha moments, or if it's, if there's confidential stuff, you don't have to talk about it, but, um, you, you can take us on a, on a short walk into potential synchronicities between these two fields. I think that'd be interesting. Well, what, what they share is both an implication for what death is all about and whether death is the end of our consciousness, because certainly in the near death experience, there are reasons to think that your consciousness does not end when the body dies. Now, some of that is just a sense of leaving the body and feeling like you're still functioning fine outside the body. But there are even more persuasive aspects of some near-death experiences that point towards the existence of a life after death. Uh, many people who have near-death experiences feel it's a blissful experience. I've been in some other realm. And if we take those at face value, which they certainly do, that suggests that you don't stop existing as soon as you die. But it doesn't necessarily say that this is an eternal life after death. Maybe you live for five minutes after your, your brain stops. And in that five minutes, you have a near-death experience, and then you end. However, some people in their near-death experience encounter deceased loved ones who have been dead for quite a while. And it's not just seeing them as if you're seeing a ghost, it's engaging with them and interacting with them in meaningful ways. Now we can often say, well, this is just wishful thinking. I knew I was near death. I wanted to see my deceased grandmother. So I imagined that she was there and we had this beautiful interaction. That doesn't work when the person you encountered was someone that you did not know was dead. You have no expectation of seeing them. Let me give you a dramatic example. Jack was a 26 year old engineer when he had a severe bout of pneumonia that put him into the hospital. And he was, this was back in, back in the seventies and they were still um, using more primitive oxygen uh, devices. And he was in and out of um, an oxygen tent coming in and out of cardiac arrest and respiratory arrest several times. And he had one particular nurse that he had grown very fond of, a young woman, a few years younger than he was, who would flirt with him from time to time um, and generally kind of try to keep his spirits up. Well, at one point she told him that she was going to be away for the weekend because it was her 21st birthday and her parents were coming in to, to celebrate with her. So he wished her well and then uh, she left. And that weekend while she was gone, he had another respiratory arrest where his lungs stopped working and he had to be artificially resuscitated. During that experience, he had a sense of leaving his body and going to some other realm. It was a beautiful garden. He was having a wonderful time. And then he sees Anita walking towards him, the nurse who had taken off for the weekend. <laughs> and he was surprised and said, Anita, what are you doing here? And she joked and said, I'll just come to fluff up your pillows like I usually do. And then she said, you have to go back now. You can't stay here. You need to tell my parents for me that I love them very much. And I'm sorry that I wrecked the red MGB. And then she turned and walked away. And he then woke up uh, in his hospital bed again. When he awoke, he excitedly told the first nurse that he saw about this experience and she ran crying from the room. He later found out that this nurse had been given a red MGB by her parents for her 21st birthday. And she was so excited, she jumped in the car, took off down the hill, crashed into a telephone pole and died instantly. Mm -hmm. Now at the time he had this experience, he had no reason to think that she was dead and certainly no way to guess how she had died. And yet he knew it accurately. And when they asked him, how did you know this? He said, Anita told me. I don't have an explanation for that. And this was not the only case like that. I published a paper about 10 years ago that had dozens of reports of these experiences 
Going back to ancient Greece and Rome, Pliny the Elder wrote a very detailed one uh, 2,000 years ago. And we have many cases from recent decades that were published in various journals of people who had a near-death experience, encountered someone, and were surprised to see them there because they thought they were still alive, and yet later they found out that person had died, often shortly before the near-death experience. We don't have an explanation for that, unless you assume that the person who, quote, died is still living in some context and still able to communicate with us. And that's something that Jim Tucker's reincarnation cases share with us. These young children who seem to remember a life of someone else who was dead, implying that that person who died now has taken on a new body. That may not be the best explanation for those cases, but it's certainly one of them, and it's one that the children themselves uh, believe. Now, I should say that although many people find near-death experiences fascinating because of what they may tell us about death, mm -hmm. what's more important to me as a psychiatrist is what they tell us about life. And the near-death experiences will often share that same belief that what was important to them was the lessons they brought back with them about how to live a life, about how to live a life that's more fulfilling and more meaningful than they had before. One of my areas of research as a psychiatrist was looking at people who had suicide attempts and then had a near-death experience as a result of that attempt and looked at how that affected them later on. And we know, for example, that most people who have a suicide attempt and survive will attempt again uh, within the next year or so. But people who have near-death experiences do not carry on their suicidal careers afterwards. And study after study has shown that having a near-death experience makes people much less suicidal. And that's kind of surprising because it makes you less afraid of dying. Mm -hmm. And often fear of death is something that stops people from killing themselves. And yet, within your death experience, you're less afraid of dying, less afraid of death, and yet you become much less suicidal. And if you ask near death experiences, they'll say, but I'm also less afraid of life. Being not afraid of dying means you're not afraid of taking chances. And that lets you live life more fully than ever before. You can enjoy things, you can uh, get into things much deeper than you could ever before because you were afraid. So they find life more beautiful, more rich, more fulfilling, and they tend to share that by relating to other people in the same way. They find when they come back that material possessions, power, prestige, fame, the things that define them as an individual no longer have meaning for them because they existed without those things. Things like your gender, your political affiliation, they didn't exist after your near-death experience when you died. And yet they were feeling fine without those things. So they come back realizing those things are not important. That's not who I am. And they tend to use words like soul or spirit to describe who they really are as opposed to the body. Mm -hmm. They say, I am inhabiting this body, but I am not this body. This was very foreign to me. I grew up thinking I was my body. And I'm sure not, still not sure how to, how to understand this, but they are quite convinced that they are something that is spiritual and just inhabiting or cooperating with this physical body. And that leads them to treat other people differently as well. They see this spiritual divinity in everybody. And they tend to be much more loving, much more altruistic, much more caring about other people. And as I said before, they often find themselves going into helping professions as a result. There's one, um, one final question while I have you. Um, uh, when I end up at chapter 19, a new view of reality. Um, I, I'm always amazed uh, by talking to different people of how much sort of these themes of the mind and consciousness have sort of moved beyond the life sciences. I, I got to spend some time with a, a fascinating gentleman at the University of uh, Minnesota who's a, 
a multiverse cosmologist, stuff <laughs> far beyond the life sciences, but uh, even in such an esoteric realm, you know, taking concepts like we have a sectillion stars and we have a electromagnetic interstellar medium and the universe technically is potentially as conscious as, <laughs> as the human brain and it has functions of neural networks and so forth. Um, all that being said, um, obviously, you started a ball rolling here a couple decades ago in this area of, of, of near-death studies. Um, what's next? Uh, you know, if the sky opened up tomorrow and a trillion dollars <laughs> fell out of it to set up the, the next Bruce Grayson uh, you know, Institute for Near-Death Studies, where you, what, what are we studying next for the, the next 10, 20 years? Are we studying uh, what survives death? Are we studying ghosts? Are we studying... Where, where, where are we going next on this journey after 2020? Hmm. That's a huge question, Ira. I know. I want to give it to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm a doctor who works with people, and that's my love. So I would spend my time working with people. I know there are fascinating questions about cosmology that this brings up, about the universe. What's the universe made out of? I know about that research suggesting there's consciousness out there without beings, um, that's beyond my, my understanding, um, Mine too. <laughs> above my pay grade for a while, for, for, so to speak. But I think there's a lot to do in what I'm interested in, which is how this changes our view of ourselves as human beings and how we fit into society and into the universe around us. And I think, you know, it's, it's hard to study the experience itself objectively because we're not there. Um, we can study what people say about it and how they act as a result of it mm -hmm. and make inferences about the experience, about its reality, its validity, and so forth. But we, what we can study objectively is how it changes people's lives. And that's where I think I would be going with this. There may be implications for what it says about do we survive death? Now, I can't say that we have proof of that. I can say that given all the evidence we have, not only from near-death experiences, but also from the children who remember past lives and from other things as well, people have spontaneous visions of deceased loved ones, that it's certainly a hypothesis we need to take seriously. It certainly seems to answer more of our questions than the hypothesis that we are just physical bodies and nothing else. Um, there are some people who say that we are physical and spiritual bodies that somehow interact together. And the problem with that is how do they interact? And we have no idea about that. There are people who try to get around that by saying, well, there is no physical world. We are just spiritual mental en entities and we imagine this physical world. And that on an intellectual level can solve all these problems, but it just, it doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't feel right to me. I am very aware of my body. And it's hard to me imagine, for me to imagine that this body is just made up in my mind. So I can't go there quite yet. And a lot of my friends who believe this say, you will eventually. <laughs> but at this point, I'm stuck with trying to explain how we have a spiritual side and a physical side and how they interact. It's not a satisfactory explanation for me, but it seems to be the best one we have yet to explain near-death experiences and other things like that. Um, Bruce, it's been an honor having you today. Uh, it's, it's, it's so exciting hearing your story and hearing your journey and... Um, Really wishing you the best for, for everything you're going to be doing next. Uh, for, for everybody listening uh, to this episode on the podcast or watching on the YouTube channel, you've been listening to the amazing Dr. Bruce Grayson, Chester Carlson, Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences, uh, UVA, uh, co-founder of the International Association for Near-Death Studies. Uh, keep an eye out for his book, After a Doctor Explores What Near-Death Experiences Reveal About Life and Beyond. Uh, Bruce, uh, it was an honor seeing you, meeting you here. Uh, really appreciate your time. And uh, thank you for everything you've done, everything you're doing, and as we say, creating a better tomorrow for all of us. It's, it's been really a great time. Thank you, Ira, for letting me share this information with your guests.